Hello and welcome to the BSP webinar, Avoidance of Doubt, the S3 Guidelines and Phase Treatment Approach to Periodontal Care within the NHS Dental Contract, Part 2. My name is Zeri Yanel and I will be your host this evening. It gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Shazad Salim. Having completed his vocational training a year as an SHO in maxillofacial surgery, Shazad returned to general dental practice. He has completed a master's in research at the University of Manchester as a part of an in-practice fellowship training award from the NIHR. He now operates four dental practices in the northwest of England with three other partners delivering NHS dental care in some of the most deprived areas in the northwest. He has been involved in several projects, including the original service redesign pilot in Oldham and Salford. He is currently chair of the Perio subgroup for the Greater Manchester LDN and has been leading the development of implementing an evidence-based care pathway approach for managing periodontal disease in the NHS dental practice called Healthy Gums Do Matter. He also delivers training on how to implement Healthy Gums Do Matter into practice through Health Education England and has recently become a council member for the British Society of Periodontology. On behalf of the BSP, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, the audience, for joining us this evening, our sponsors for tonight's webinar, Action, and of course, Dr. Salim for giving up his time to speak with us. As a reminder, tonight's webinar will last a little over one hour and will be followed by an opportunity for questions. So please feel free to submit your questions in the usual way via the questions box, and I will collate these and present them to Shazad at the end of today's talk. Without further ado, I hand you over to Dr. Shazad Salim. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening, everybody. It's nice to be here and eventually get to present this presentation on the avoidance of doubt and the updated guidance in regards to how we manage periodontal disease within NHS practice under the current UDA system. We've been trying to do this for a while with Healthy Gums Do Matter. And it's good to see now the progress as it's going forward. Just to first want to say many thanks to Action for sponsoring this webinar and a big shout out to Stancy as well, who came forward very quickly at short notice actually to make this free uh, for everybody to attend. So without further ado, what we're gonna try and cover today are quite a, lot of, quite a number of things. It'll be a whistle stop tour uh, in the beginning of really looking at the classification, just a brief touch on the classification a brief uh, introduction to the S3 guidelines. Those uh, detailed webinars are available, available on the um, BSP website for you to watch. And also Ian's uh, webinar last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, also covers that in a bit more detail. But I'll just do a brief overview of the um, principles behind the stepwise approach to treatment. We will then be looking at a detailed uh, walk through the pathway that we've been developed as a part of this avoidance of doubt document on how we're going to take our patients from step one of care through all the way through initial phases, engaging with the patient, uh, empowering them to take ownership of their oral hygiene, their plaque control, then to delivering therapy, to reassessing them, and then hopefully getting them into stability and maintenance and how we are going to go about doing that within the current UDA system. So it's been an interesting journey over the past five years. A lot has happened in the Perio world and we are at a very interesting um, point, really. I mean, when I started with Healthy Gums Do Matter eight years ago, I think maybe if this we were at this point now, maybe that would not have taken place. Why? Because we've had a lot of clarification on a number of issues. So we've started off in 2017 with the International Work uh, World Workshop for Classification of Periodontal Diseases that was officially launched at Europe Perio in 2018. And then the BSP quickly realized that we needed a more practical, implementable model for the UK. And so the UK, uh, the BSP's implementation of that classification system was then launched in 2019. And we've been using that classification system for a few years now. And I, you know, I think most people have, you know, are comfortable with it and hopefully using it within practice. Having now classified disease and we've classified periodontitis patients, how do we then go about managing disease? And this is where this S3 level guidelines comes in. And that was first produced at a European level um, back in 2020. And they released their uh, S3 treatment level guidelines for stages one to three periodontitis. And then the BSP went through a grade development process, which is a new term that we were introduced to back in the first lockdown uh, back in 2020. 
uh, of taking those treatment guidelines and a good learning outcome maybe from the classification experience was that actually everything that's produced on an international or a European level is not necessarily implementable at a local host nation level. There, each individual country has their own, you know, uh, healthcare systems and their own ways of working. And so things need to, to be either adopted or adapted. And we'll look at that, you know, great development process, a brief little overview of what that entailed. Having now implemented the treatment uh, um, of periodontitis stages one to three, it was a, a good carry on from that to really look at the NHS uh, contract and really understand that the terminology used within that contract actually is quite dated. It talks about root planing, uh, subgingival curatage, terms that we don't, you know, approaches that we don't use any longer. And these are things that are triggering band two claims. So it really needed to be updated to, you know, in line with the current evidence base. And that's where we had a joint collaboration with the um, uh, Office of the Chief Dental Officer, the BSP and the BSA. And we then updated the uh, phased care treatment approach. It was initially for caries and now it includes periodont uh, periodontitis as well. So we're we'll going through that journey and having a look at what that, how that looks like. So from the World Workshop 2017, they released their papers uh, and their international workshop classification. And the BSP, like I said, quickly realized that we needed a more practical, simpler, implementable model that can be used on a daily day basis, like myself, who's a general dental practitioner, work for 99% within the NHS, to be able to use it effectively and efficiently. Okay, then, as I've said, we moved on to the S3 uh, guidelines at a European level, and then the great development process, this new term, where we take those guidelines and we see how we can either adopt them, take them as they are, or adapt them uh, for the UK uh, healthcare system. Okay, and then earlier on, uh, around about April last year, the BSP then released their implementation of those S3 level guidelines. Alongside that, we had a uh, change uh, on updating the glossary of terms. So we've had now had a, uh, hopefully the death of scale and polish, and Ian will be very happy to try and see this. We'll hopefully we'll be reading the final funeral rites to it soon. But we've now replaced that terminology with supergingival professional mechanical plaque control. So we now talk about supergingival professional mechanical plaque control, and that encompasses a number of things from scaling, uh, supergingival calculus, staining removal, and prophylaxis, etc. And then we go on to our treatment for periodontitis. And traditionally, we've all been accustomed with the term root surface debridement, but now this has been updated. And in the uh, S3 guidelines, it talks about subgingival instrumentation or subgingival professional mechanical plaque control. Again, what is this? Systematic removal of the subgingival plaque, calculus, and endotoxin from the root surface. So these are just some of the terms that have been updated. This glossary of terms can be found on the BSP website. And alongside that, there's a couple of terms there that, and, and approaches that we no longer use, such as root planing. Um, we want to try and preserve cementum when we're treating uh, periodontitis. And this uh, concept of subgingival curatage as well. But however, when we look at the current regulation for a band two claim, it states that a band two claim can be generated once non-surgical periodontal treatment, including root planing, deep scaling, irrigation of periodontal pockets, and subgingival curatage, and all necessary scaling and polishing is carried out. So this was the problem with the current regulation, and so it really needed to be updated. And that's where we had now the avoidance of doubt documents taking place and really looking at this how are we going to take the stepwise approach to managing periodontitis, how we can fit that within the UDA model. We understand that contract reform is happening and at some point we we'll, might see a new contract, but in the interim period, we want to raise the standards of periodontal management within NHS practice, within primary dental care. Okay, so these two documents were released. The first is the official NHS document, uh, which went through the gateway and it was updated to include now the management of periodontitis through this phase treatment approach. That's the document on the right hand side and the document on the left hand side is a narrative that goes behind it and these two documents really need to be read together so they go hand in hand. Both documents are there available on the BSP website under publications to you to access and have a read through but we'll be going through this and explaining the principles behind it and ultimately we've now mapped the steps of care to the different courses of treatment as we go through a journey. And it's a recognition that actually a patient 
management of periodontitis is a lifelong process. And so we need to recognize that. We also need to recognize the limitations of the current funding model and the, you know, really recognize what is it that is most important. We need to get our patients to engage. That investment in patient engagement and education and behavior change at the beginning of the pathway will then ultimately lead to successful outcomes. And that's what we've tried to do here with mapping this stepwise approach to the courses of treatment. Again, this document is available on the BSP website. <clears throat> Okay, so what are S3 level guidelines? What's the big deal? Why should we be paying attention when it comes to S3 guidelines? I mean, the way I really look at the S3 guidelines, it's like they're delivering better oral health for perio. All the sort of questions that you wanted to have answered are really detailed in there, whether, you know, should we use interdental brushes? Should we use floss? Should we use you know, mouthwashes, et cetera? It details all the evidence base and the recommendations alongside it. But why is S3 such a big deal? S3 is such a big deal because why it takes, it's a very structured process where we take the evidence base, so the systematic reviews, and we then form a representative stakeholder group, which is not necessarily just periodontologists. It, it has broad stakeholder representation from hygienists, from therapists, endodontists, restorative dentistry, uh, you know, FGDP, OCDO's office, etc even we in for the bsp's development process we have patient representation something that the uh, european workshop actually didn't have and it then looks at the evidence base and it produces its then recommendations from the evidence base and so it's a very structured and regulated process uh, to go through and we then end up with a very high level of recommendations and guidelines and that's why we should pay attention and they are very important So, as I've said, this happened back in 2020 when the first lockdown happened. And so after the International uh, European Federation of Periodontology released their guidelines, uh, the BSP quickly went into action and we had to do this all online via Zoom meetings. And so we then went through this similar process at the European level, but then updated the evidence based, looked at the recommendations and then produced our UK treatment guidelines. And like I said, we had broad stakeholder representation from different uh, various uh, stakeholders, including patients. So the grade development process, what does it mean? Basically, it is either taking those guidelines produced at a European level and adopting them, means we take them as they are, or we adapt them slightly, and you know, for the UK model, okay? It is a very um, robust process. I'm getting a bit of feedback just there. I'm not sure if somebody else's mic is on. Um, but um, it is where we, uh, four working groups were set up by the DSP. And then we had, uh, and then we had Four, uh, three working groups were set up by the BSP covering the four steps of care. So steps one and four, steps two and steps three. And then each of all the documentation was sent out prior to those meetings to the uh, each member of the stakeholder and they each had to declare a conflict of interest as well. So it's a very uh, regulated process. And this was the paper that was released and it's an open access paper. It is a long paper, 74 odd pages, but it is important and I think it's well worth reading. And the BSP have produced a number of webinars to go behind that to support that. Alongside that, you'll find on the BSP website, the resources available in the publication section where they have a specific section on the S3 guidelines, okay? And anybody who's not a member for the BSP, this is my plug for them, please join. It is a very good organization and you know I've been working with them for a long time now. They supported me very much over the years and we've tried to put on a webinar schedule this year, which is you know quite broad and um, you know if you end up paying for the webinars, you will end up basically covering your uh, BSP membership fee. So that's my little plug for the BSP. Okay, so the resources that came alongside it were these the flow charts that I'm sure you've all seen. Again, downloadable from the BSP website, where it just, uh, you know, nice infographics just to show the steps of care as we go through that process. Okay, alongside that, there's a nice explanation video that was professionally produced as well. Okay, so what are the, what is this stepwise approach to treatment? Okay, so we first, we start with a periodontitis patient. These are treatment guidelines for periodontitis patients. 
So first of all, we start with our examination risk assessment and our classifying classification and diagnosis. This is the BSB's implementation of the 2017 workshop. So once we have a periodontitis patient, we're going to take them through a stepwise process of care through this journey. Step one of care is all about controlling local and systemic risk factors. So local risk factors, overhangs, calculus, patients, oral hygiene. We want to empower the patient to be able to take ownership of their oral hygiene, their self-care, in order to be able to achieve successful outcomes for treatment. So we want to control the local system, uh, risk factors as well as systemic risk factors, diabetes, smoking, etc. Okay. Once we have controlled these local risk factors, we can then reassess the patient. And if the patient is engaging, we can then progress them onto step two of care. What is step two of care? Step two of care is all about non-surgical periodontal management. So it's your detailed periodontal charting. It's your root surface debridement, what we're now terming subgingival instrumentation or subgingival professional mechanical plaque control. It's controlling the subgingival, it's aiming to you know, eliminate that subgingival endotoxin and control that biofilm, okay? Once we've delivered our treatment, we then need to reevaluate and see if that treatment has been successful or not. And that's where step three of care comes in. We then reassess the patient, re-examine the patient, re-conduct our pocket chart and assess, is the patient either stable or unstable? If the patient still has residual pocketing and unstable signs, probing pocket depths of four millimeters or more with bleeding and probing, then we need to retreat those non-responding signs. And this can encompass either re-subgingival instrumentation. And if we've done that a couple of times in the UK, then we might move on to surgery, such as access surgery, resective surgery, or regeneration. By the end of step three of care, we are then hoping that the patient has now achieved stability, okay? In principle, step four of care is about patients with periodontitis, which is stable or in remission. And this now, they move into supportive periodontal care, which is a lifelong supportive process. This patient leads lifelong supportive care. This can be anywhere between three and 12 months tailored to the individual risk profile for that patient. So if we go back to step zero, and the foundation for this is a classification system. And I'm sure you're all you know, aware of the classification system. I don't want to go into too much detail on this. I'm just gonna briefly touch on a few points and just a few nuances in it, maybe just to make sure everyone's clear with regards to how they are going about this process. This was the staging and grading matrix that was produced by the BSP. And it's going through you, how we stage patients. So we're taking interproximal bone loss. Stage one is early or mild which is less than 15% or less than two millimeters. And we'll come back to this because stage one really is the tricky one and the one that we need to pay attention to. Why? Because we want to treat it early. It has you know, a greater uh, impact on the patient, less cost implications going forward, but it is probably one of the more difficult ones to pick up. Stage two is moderate disease, okay, where we have bone loss within the coronal third of the root. Stage three, severe disease, where we have bone loss on the worst affected site within the mid third of the root and stage four, very severe disease. And we describe that as either localized up to 30% and generalized more than 30% of teeth. And then the grading is all about the susceptibility of the patient, and we take this bone loss to age ratio, so it's either slowly progressing, moderately progressing, or rapidly progressing. Okay, so we're staging, we're now classifying the patients according to stages one, two, three, or four, grade A, B, or C, the distribution of the disease, which is either localized or generalized, and then the risk factor profile, specifically smoking and diabetes, and then any other risk factors as well. Just to note, classification we're going to do as a one-off. So we do our classification when we see the patient initially. Once we've classified that patient, in principle, we don't need to go back and reclassify the patient every time we see them. What we do is we then diagnose our patients. So we've classified them now. We've got a stage two grade B patient. And we now need to re-examine re them every time we see the patient to see are they stable, meaning bleeding and probing less than 10%, probing pocket depths of four millimeters or less, with no bleeding and probing at four millimeter sites. Or are they in remission, which is pretty much exactly the same, but bleeding and probing is over 10%. So there's still no unstable sites, meaning probing pocket depths of four millimeters or less, with no bleeding and probing at four millimeter sites. Or are they unstable? And in the paper, we've defined that as probing pocket depths of four millimeters or greater with bleeding and probing, or probing pocket depths of five millimeters or greater. A point to note there, 
that you know higher probing depths of five and six millimeters in the absence of bleeding and probing may not represent active disease especially if they've just undergone periodontal treatment the key here is bleeding and probing the best predictor for stability of disease we have is the absence of bleeding and probing about 30 percent of sites that bleed and probe will break down further around about 98 99 percent of sites with the absence of bleeding and probing in brackets in a non-smoker will not deteriorate any further so the absence of bleeding and probing is, is really key when we're measuring these. What's the important thing here is that we record these pocket depths, we continually monitor these pockets and make sure they remain stable. If they then start to bleed and probing, then we might need to do re go back and do some retreatment on these sites. Okay, so staging is really now reflecting the severity of disease at presentation. It's really telling us what's happened up to this moment in time. For the BSP, we're using radiographic interproximal bone loss. So we're assessing our radiographs. We're looking at the worst site of bone loss, and we're going to stage according to that worst site of bone loss. It's important to note that a patient doesn't regress to a lower stage of periodontitis. So as if they their disease gets worse, they go from a stage two to a stage three to a stage four. They don't then regress back to going back to a stage three, back to a stage two, if, for example, you took those periodontally involved teeth out. No, it's about determining their risk profile and how they present it so they remain at stage three or four uh, respectively uh, respectively grading is then looking at the susceptibility of the disease to uh, of the patient to that disease process and the best indicator of rate of pro progression is the historic disease experience for that patient and again we're going to use the worst site of bone loss and we're going to use this bone loss to age ratio which we'll explain in a few slides time okay so staging, what is staging? Then uh, for the, oh, well, I don't, don't want to say older members, but some of you might remember this uh, game show, Strike It Lucky, with uh, Michael Barrymore, and he used to go along and ask his contestants to choose from a screen, top, middle, or bottom. So staging is, is easy. You look at your radiographs, you assess the worst site of bone loss, and then you're going to stage according to it. So if bone loss is in the top, it's a stage two. If it's in the middle, it's a stage three. And if it's at the bottom, it's a stage four. What's the tricky one? If it's just a little bit, stage one. And these are the subtle changes that we need to look out for. Okay. It's important to note that stage four is assigned if a patient has lost any teeth due to bone loss within the apical third of the two uh, of the tooth of the root. Okay, so a stage four is assigned if a patient has lost any teeth due to bone loss within the apical third of the root. Okay. What's a difficult one is stage one. Stage one, why is it so difficult? We have two measurements there that, that have been put up, less than 15% or less than two millimeters. Why is stage one difficult? Because it's not always the case that we have periapical radiographs to determine less than 15% bone loss. So if we have periapical radiographs, then it's easy enough to determine less than 15% bone loss. However, if we don't have periapical radiographs, the next thing we might have are bite wing radiographs. And if we have bite wing radiographs, we're less, measuring less than two millimeters bone loss measured from normal bone levels. So remember, normal bone levels lie within two to three millimeters of the CEJ. So we need to make an assessment. Where are the normal bone levels? And is that bone loss then less than two millimeters from the normal bone level? And if we have no radiographs or they're not clinically justified, then we are measuring less than two millimeters clinical attachment loss. That is measured from the CEJ because in health, our attachment level is at the CEJ. So just to explain that further, a, a little um, uh, x-ray, this is one that Ian, uh, Professor Ian Chappell has uh, kindly allowed me to use. We have the CEJ here, okay? We have our normal bone level here, that's the green line. Then we have our reduced bone level at the red line, and it's less than two millimeters between the green and red line. So it's less than two millimeters from normal bone levels. So it becomes now important that we understand what normal bone levels look like and we assess our radiographs. We're very good when it comes to assessing caries and we make a good caries diagnosis and a good caries report. But we need to start looking a bit more closely when it comes down to interproximal bone loss on bite wings as well and other radiographs. So we're looking at, you know, is there thin, smooth, evenly corticated margins to the intercrestal bone in the posterior regions? You might not see that anteriorly due to the thin uh, crestal bone anteriorly. Okay, uh, the inter interdental crestal bone is continuous with the lamina dura. 
Okay, so it's continuous going over here. We have a sharp angle here and even periodontal ligament space. So these are the th things that we're looking out for when it comes down to normal bone levels. And then we have diseased sites. We're having loss of cortification. Might not always be uh, apparent depending upon the, you know, the X-ray and the quality of the X-ray. Widening of this periodontal ligament space. Okay, and then loss of this sharp angle here. So we need to look at our bone levels, um, assess them a bit more carefully and try and pick up stage one disease uh, you know, early on and then manage and treat it as well. Because stage one disease in an engaging patient should respond very well. And Eric Waits in his book, he puts it nicely here where he describes a number of infographics uh, here where he's showing normal bone level where you can see that uh, uh, cortication uh, continues with the lamina dura going all the way around the teeth, even periodontal ligament space, sharp angle here, normal bone levels two to three millimeters within the CEJ. Stage one is the difficult one. This is where you have these subtle changes, early bone loss, which we need to detect. Stages two, three, and four are, you know, is either bone loss was in the coronal third of the root, it's either in the mid third of the root, or the apex or the uh, apical third of the root. So these are the easier ones to detect. It's stage one that we just need to pay a bit more attention to. Okay, then grading. Once we've had, our, we've looked at our radiographs, we've assessed whether the worst site of bone loss, we've now staged the patient, we're now looking at the grading and we're now looking at the percentage bone loss to age ratio. So we'll look at the age of the patient and if that bone loss is less than half the age of the patient, it's a grade A. So if you have an 80 year old patient, if they have less than 40% bone loss, it's a grade A. If they have more than 80% bone loss, it's a grade C. So if the bone loss is greater than the age of the patient, it's a grade C, everything else is a grade B. And the great thing is you don't need a calculator to be able to do this, okay? Then we're gonna make a separate statement about the risk factors, specifically diabetes and smoking uh, as well. In the international workshop, these the risk factors for smoking and diabetes were used as grade modifiers, but with the BSP, we're treating them as a separate statement within our overall diagnostic statement. Okay, the distribution of the disease then is either localized, so in a mouth of 28, then you know approximately eight or nine teeth, less than that is localized, more than that is generalized, or this molar incisor pattern of bone loss. And smoking and risk uh, and diabetes, then we want to make a statement about this, uh, about the patients, whether they smoke, if they're a current smoker or the previous smoker, if they were a previous smoker when they stopped, how many they used to smoke a day and how long for. Diabetes is optimally controlled, HbA1c is less than 7%, or suboptimally controlled, HbA1c is over 7%. So we do need to ask about our diabetic patients and how well controlled their diabetes is and try and you know, document those HbA1c levels. And then a complete comprehensive risk factor, risk factor assessment as well. Okay, and we are aiming to produce this overall diagnostic uh, statements. That, so this is, includes a classification and it includes a diagnosis. So we have generalized periodontitis, stage four, grade B, currently unstable with risk factors, smoking over 10 cigarettes a day and suboptimally controlled diabetes. So this is what we're aiming for as our overall diagnostic statement. This includes our diagnosis and our classification. Now that we've had, a, now that we have a periodontitis patient, we then move them to step one of care. Okay, and we're now gonna work with our patients to control those local and systemic risk factors. But what has the biggest impact when it comes down to the different steps of care here? And this is a graph that Ian uh, came down to see us in Manchester, and this was our light bulb moment when, it come, when we had Healthy Gums Do Matter. And he showed us this graph, and it's taken from one of his books, and you know, you'll see this quite widespread now. It's in the Avoidance of Doubt documents, it's in the Restorative Commissioning Guide, but it's basically showing the steps of therapy against the number of disease sites. We have the number of disease sites on the vertical axis against these steps of care on the horizontal axis. And it's showing how that responds as we go through the steps of care. And you'll notice the biggest reduction we're having here is in step one of care. You can say, you know, anywhere around 60, 65 percent of reduction of disease sites. So probing pocket depths of four millimeters or greater with bleeding and probing have been reduced on the completion of step one of, th of, uh, of therapy. The biggest reduction you'll see here is in the education phase, before we even touch the patient, before we even actually do any treatment on our patients. So let's take an example. So if we start on the basis, we now have a patient. This is one of my patients. It was a 28-year-old female who came as a new patient to the practice. 
she'd had a knock in her front teeth from her young son and she was now worried that her lower teeth were loose. She hadn't seen a dentist for the past 10 years. So we saw her for a new patient examination and then we went through step one of care. So we started off with educating the patient about their responsibilities, about their brushing regime, incidental cleaning. We advise also single tufted brushes. In this case, we also recommended an electric toothbrush, but we went through a comprehensive uh, personalized self-care plan for this patient. And then patient comes back a few weeks later and we reassess them. So step one of care, what is it all about? It's all about contra controlling the supragingival dental biofilm. Okay, professional mechanical plaque control, which is supragingival scaling or subgingival scaling of the clinical crowns. That's what is in the S3 guidelines and also the avoidance of doubt document. In healthy gums of matter, we use a slightly different approach where we do supra and subgingival scaling, where we just, if you see calculus, we remove it. And then risk factor control. So smoking, diabetes, etc. Note, step one of care is delivered for all periodontitis patients. The aim being, if we are going to get, if we are aiming to get successful outcomes, then we need to get step one of care right. We need to get the patient to be able to develop the skills in order to be able to achieve adequate plaque control for them to be able to manage their disease. It's laying the foundations for our treatment. And our treatment won't be successful until we've got the patient engaging with step one of care. Okay. So patient then comes back. We've educated the patient now on how to you know, brush properly. And so a few weeks later, a couple of weeks later, the patient comes back and this is their situation. So they've gone away now and this patient obviously had a wake up call. It was a, uh, you know, uh, she was now concerned about losing her front teeth and she's gone away and she's done exactly what we've asked her to do. So she's brushing now twice a day. She's using the incidental brushes. She's using the single tufted brush. That's what we advise in this case specifically. And so we've gone from here to here within a couple of weeks. And so you can see the massive, you know, reduction in marginal bleeding, improvement in plaque control. You can see some of this subgingival calculus even coming super gingival. So this is just without even actually doing anything, just educating the patient. We then complete step one of care. And like I said, in, in healthy gums of matter, we take a slightly different approach where we, we do super and subgingival scaling in, in the aim to remove calculus to in order to facilitate oral hygiene. With the avoidance of doubt documents, then we've said super gingival professional mechanical plaque control. That can involve subgingival scaling of the clinical crown as well. And at the end of step one of care, the patient is now here. So they've gone from here to here within step one of care. Now, if that patient now goes away and they engage with the process and they continue with their you know, oral hygiene, incidental cleaning, then when we come down to reassess them here in three months time and reevaluate, we're gonna make an assessment. Is this patient an engaging patient? If they are, they will progress on to step two of care. If they're a non-engaging patient and they haven't achieved those adequate uh, oral hygiene improvement, plaque control, reduction in marginal bleeding, then they go back into step one of care because ultimately our treatment won't be successful unless the patient is engaging with that process. How do we define patient engagement? Then in the avoidance of doubt documents and also here on the S3 flow chart, we've said that that is either a greater than 50% reduction in both plaque and bleeding scores or plaque scores less than 20% and bleeding scores less than 30%. And the opposite is for a non-engaging patient. Okay, so then we move on to step two of care. Step two of care is all about controlling and eliminating the subgingival biofilm, decontamination of that root surface, use of your, uh, your, your adjuncts as appropriate, Okay, note about antibiotics. Antibiotics are to, you know, only in specific cases, really those grade C patients with rapidly progressing disease. Um, and really that's, you know, lying at a level two stroke three care. So they're really making the decisions with regards to, you know, adjunctive uh, antimicrobials. So here we're really focusing on controlling that subgingival dental biofilm. We're doing our subgingival professional, mecha mecha professional mechanical plaque control. Okay, and so we then have a further reduction in the number of disease sites. We're then going to reevaluate that patient and redo our pocket chart and assess our outcome. Is the patient either stable? They'll move on to supportive care. If they're still unstable, then we might do some re-instrumentation. And if re-instrumentation is still not successful, then they might be a candidate for surgery, such as access flap surgery, resective or regenerative surgery. Then we have a further reduction in the, in the disease sites and hopefully getting to now we get to either 
uh, stability or the patient in remission. Ideally, we want the patient to be stable. But you'll notice here that it's not necessarily the case that we can eliminate all of the pockets. There might be a few residual pockets left. And in principle, if we've got pockets of four, uh, four or less pockets with probing pocket depths of five millimeters or greater, we will take that as consistent with disease remission. But they might need continual subgingival instrumentation a part of their supportive care program going forward. Okay, so in principle, step four of care is for patients with stable periodontitis or periodontitis in remission, or we accept a few residual sites, again, from the papers, less than four sites with probing pocket depths of five millimeters or greater is con deemed consistent with disease remission or control after active treatment. Okay, and this is a lifelong journey now. The patient requires lifelong supportive care going forward, tailored to the individual risk profile for that patient. Again, in the S3 guideline, that's anywhere between three and 12 months time. Going back to the step one of care and the most important impact, then uh, this was a very nice study that was done in 2000, well, it was published in 2019, the previous study, and it was looking at really oral hygiene revisited and the importance of that step one of care and the patient engaging with the process. And what they did actually, this is a specialist practice in Norway where they had uh, patients awaiting to be seen for assessment on a waiting list. And so they um, conducted a study on patients where they formed two groups, a test group and a control group. Um, the, the control group carried on as normal. So their normal procedure was they'll send an email out to the patient. The patient would attend for an examination, radiographs, um, and then they would then go onto the waiting list for treatment that could anywhere be between you know, three to six months time. And so those patients were then uh, not recruited at that point to the study. Actually, these patients were consented at the end of that three month or second visit into the study retrospectively. The um, test group was the oral hygiene group. And these patients received a telephone call uh, two weeks before their appointment to, to uh, consent them for participation in the study. And so they were given that telephone call really to uh, inform them that the appointment that they were going to come to was a longer appointment. They said one and a half hours was the appointment time where they were going to go through that uh, same process for the control group. But they're going to have one additional measure. What was that? It was an oral hygiene visit. They were going to have a personalized self-care plan delivered to them. And it was a hygienist in this case that did that. And so they had this um, individually tailored or hygiene regime. It was a personalized self-care plan some standardized information was given in writing, and then it was then tailored to the uh, individual patient, and some things, uh, some things were written down to populate that personalized self-care plan for that patient. Um, it was just a note here that they said that some supragingival scaling was done in those areas where interproximal uh, areas were closed by calculus. So it was a very minimal supragingival scaling just to allow the patient to be able to engage with that process. So control group, had basically their examination and assessment. So what was recorded, plaque, con uh, plaque scores, bleeding scores, probing pocket depths were recorded. And the control, uh, the um, test group had the same, except they were given this oral hygiene visit as well. Both of these groups were then followed up three months later. Okay, uh, three months later, they were followed up and the same indices were recorded. And so what do we find here? Then when we look at the control group, the uh, mean plaque score was 61% and the mean bleeding and probing size 57%. When we look at the test group, actually what was surprising is that their mean plaque scores and bleeding scores were a lot less than the control group. Now this was a randomized trial and so this was a little bit surprising to them. Um, they sort of put this down to maybe the whole thorn effect that they said, basically if big brother's watching then you're going to change your behavior and because they had the telephone call a couple of weeks prior to this appointment, then they said this could be the reason why these uh, the uh, oral hygiene group had a lower plaque and bleeding scores here. They also said actually that to engage, to detect a difference on these patients then was a bit more difficult because the reduction then was less than the control group. And then they documented the number of sites with probing pocket depths of four millimeters, five millimeters, six millimeters, and seven millimeters. And then they re-recorded these indices three months later. And what was amazing to see was actually the reduction in the percentage sites with plaque. It went down from 36% to 4.7%. Bleeding or probing went down from around 39% to 11.7%. And the mean probing pocket depth reduced to 2.8 millimeters. 
When you compare that to the control group, their mean pro probing pocket depth remained high at five millimeters. And again, they didn't see much difference in, in plaque, uh, per mean percentage plaque scores and bleeding and probing scores. So this had a significant impact, just that oral hygiene visit, just educating the patient on their disease process. What was also very interesting is that the mean probing pocket depth reduction was 1.6 millimeters. 1.6 millimeters mean probing pocket depth reduction in the oral hygiene group over that three month period. And one of the things that really stood out to me at the end of the paper was they said in the oral hygiene group, out of the 680 sites with probing pocket depths of six millimeters or greater, at the three month follow up, they only had 67 sites with probing pocket depths of six millimeters or greater. So we know the impact of oral hygiene and the importance. And now, you know, the whole process of this avoidance of doubt is trying to refocus and reinvest that finance into step one of care. Why? Because the problem here, all the band two payments, are to, you know, all, the, all the finance is taken with band two payments at the end of the pathway, yet the biggest impact is at the beginning of the pathway. And that's where we want to try and shift. We want to try and shift that focus and really you know empower our gdps to be able to invest that time and effort at the beginning beginning of the pathway because if we get the first part of the pathway right step one of care right and the patient's engaging then we will get a reduction in the disease initially and then we can carry on you know and hopefully treat that disease successfully and get our patients to stability and then into supportive periodontal care so avoidance of doubt then came along and um, we've it's been out for a few months now and so we know the challenges within NHS practice. We know the challenges within the current UDA contract. I'm not going to go too much into that because we are running a bit short of time. Um, but it's really recognizing that the regulation at the moment was dated. It was not now in line with the current evidence base. We now have the S3 guidelines and it was now, you know, uh, time that we tried to in embed these S3 guidelines within the current contracts. Okay, just a couple of points to note as a, the technicalities. When we come down to uh, doing the phase care treatment approach, it's very important that we use the correct terminology. If we're using review, then that is included in the same course of treatment. So if you write review three months, for example, that means when you see the patient in three months time, it's a part of the original course of treatment. What we need to be writing in our notes is re-examination and reassessment of the patient. That triggers a new course of treatment. And don't shoot the messenger, but a band two claim must have an examination undertaken by a dentist alongside all the usual regulation FP17 DC form and the patient aware of their charges, etc. Okay, so let's now have a look at the avoidance of doubt documents and take a look at the journey through that pathway. Avoidance of doubt, what is it? Then basically, this was initially produced for caries and it's now been modified um, for to include periodontitis as well. And without going into too much of the politics, getting things through uh, the NHS gateway is difficult. And, you know, we want to try and try and do this as quickly as possible. So we've now amended the uh, document to include the management of periodontitis. But it does say in the introduction that, you know, phase treatment principles are up to three courses of treatment within a 12 month period. Well, you will see actually, we've got four courses of treatment on our pathway. It's usually aimed at patients who haven't accessed dental care within the past 24 months, those with high needs, um, vulnerable backgrounds, additional social needs, etc. Patients need to be aware that they are entering a phase tr uh, care treatment approach, which might you know, involve multiple courses of treatment. Um, and the reasons need to be detailed why we're taking that approach and appropriate FP17 DC forms, etc. need to be completed, signed uh, for each course of treatment. Um, because this was an amendment, then, you know, this is, has to be taken with a bit of a pinch of salt when it comes down to the uh, periodontitis patients. Why? Because we are trying to improve the standards of periodontal care within NHS practice and trying to invest into that. And so if that's the case, then these really, you know, it's not likely that you, you know, your periodontitis patients haven't been seen for 24 months, etc. So we, we have the understanding that, you know, when it comes down to periodontitis patient, then, you know, it's not specifically that all of these things necessarily apply. So this is the pathway. And so now we're gonna take a stepwise pro, uh, approach through this pathway and take it visit by visit and have a look, what are we doing? What are we claiming? And how does the pathway work? So let's have a look at the patient journey. Okay, so we start with step one of care. Step one of care is over here. 
And what does that entail? Basically, it's classification and diagnosis. So you've done your examination, you've done your risk assessment, you've diagnosed the periodontitis patient. They're now going to enter into step one of care. As we've said, step one of care is delivered on all periodontitis patients. Aim here is to control local and systemic risk factors. From the NHS point of view and the avoidance of doubt, what do we need to do? So we've done our examination risk assessment and our BPE, appropriate radiographs as per the BPE guidelines. So if you've got BPE code threes and fours, crestal bone levels should be visible on your radiographs. Code threes, you might get away with bite wings if there's not a lot of historic disease. Code fours, you're really more into periapicals. And then baseline plaque and bleeding scores. So we need to docu have an assessment of patient engagement. The gold standard when it comes to patient engagement is plaque and ble uh, full mouth plaque and bleeding scores. But here we've taken a more pragmatic approach where we've said, you know, instead of a full mouth plaque and bleeding sore, if you're doing it, carry on doing it, it's the gold standard. If not, then we are allowing a plaque and bleeding score to be done on Ramford's teeth, but in the avoidance of doubt documents, it is with disclosing. Risk factor ass uh, assessment and identification, your provisional diagnosis and classification, so you wanna try and get your diagnostic statement from your radiographs and from your examination. You need to warn the patients that they have periodontitis, you know, and the consequences of periodontitis in its later stages can lead to tooth mobility, tooth loss. We're going to deliver behavior change, oral hygiene and practical advice, uh, really try and deliver that personalized self-care plan for that patient, what they need to do in order to be able to achieve the adequate plaque and bleeding scores to be able to progress into step two of care. Professional mechanical plaque control, that super gingival scaling, plus or minus sub gingival scaling of the clinical crown, and then any other treatment alongside your, uh, which is needed. So, you know, for example, if it's a new patient, then if they had any stabilization of caries, this goes alongside this as well. Okay, and we expect that, you know, step one of care will take more than one visit. Okay, when it comes down to your plaque and bleeding scores, then what is the this uh, abbreviated plaque and bleeding scoring method? Well, it's taking Ramford's teeth. What are Ramford's teeth? They're six teeth in the mouth, upper right six, upper left one, lower left four, uh, upper left four, sorry, four, sorry, lower left six, lower right one, lower right four. And we divide the two, each tooth into four surfaces. And so here we've said disclose each of those teeth. And you know, you can find various different disclosing solutions out there. Curaprox have one. I think TP have stopped their plaque search disclosing solution out there now, but that, there's a couple more on the market out there. Uh, or alternatively, you use disclosing tablets and disclose the full mouth. And if you detect plaque on a surface, it's a score of one. And if there's no plaque, it's a score of zero. So you get your total score and you then divide by the maximum score that that can be. So if we have six Ramford's teeth, four surfaces per tooth, maximum score of a one, the maximum score will be 24. So it's your score divided by 24, multiply by 100, and that gives you your percentage plaque score. Then we go on to the bleeding score. The, and here it's just important to note, we're looking at marginal bleeding. We're not looking at bleeding and probing. What's the difference between marginal bleeding and bleeding and probing? Well, these two diagrams here show the difference. When we're doing bleeding and probing, we are probing to the base of the pocket. So your probe is parallel to the long axis of the tooth. When we're doing marginal bleeding, it's 45 degrees to the tooth and you are running it along just below the gingival margin. Why? Because we're looking at patient engagement. We want to see how well the patient is removing a plaque on a daily basis. And if they are able to remove plaque on a daily basis, they should have the absence of marginal bleeding. They might still have bleeding and probing. We haven't treated the base of the pocket, but there should be an absence of marginal bleeding. And here we're looking at marginal bleeding to assess patient engagement. And it goes back down to your histopathology where we're looking at, you know, the first clinical signs of inflammation, four to seven days, it's that early lesion. So that's why, you know, if I'm going to take precedence, I'm taking precedence for my marginal bleeding score. Why? Because it's telling me how well that patient has brushed over the past week. So I take each of the four uh, surfaces of Ramford's teeth. I then do a marginal bleeding score. If I've got marginal bleeding, it's a score of one, no marginal bleeding score of zero. Again, you calculate your percentage score by dividing by 24 and times in, uh, multiplying by 100. That personalized self-care plan will help you along with that process in step one of care. And this is uh, the patient agreement from Healthy Gums Do Matter. You know, th these are resources there that for you to be able to use. Um, we've developed them and tried to make it easy for you. They are downloadable from the BSP website. So, you know, uh, although we haven't said, uh, you know, to put a written patient agreement within the avoidance of doubt document, I think it's something that's recommended. Even the, yes, 
in the um, S3 guideline, it talks about you know uh, developing this personalized self-care plan for the patient. And if it's written there and it's agreed with the patient, then you can always come back to it. And at least the patient goes away with a written you know, personalized self-care plan for what they need to do to be able to achieve adequate plaque control. Um, also outlines here the reasons why we're delaying step two of care or you know, formal periodontal therapy until the patient is able to achieve adequate plaque control. Alongside that, there's other resources there, uh, such as your periodontal leaflet and consent form. You know, again, we've updated them with the uh, to include the new new classification system here. So again, this is uh, outlines uh, the um, risks for treatment. So you know, recession of the gums, black triangle appearance, etc., and also goes through what is periodontitis, signs and symptoms, some of the risk factors, and the patient can either give informed consent or informed refusal. So again, this is some of the resources there available to you. Uh, easy to download if you want to use them in practice they're there so now we've delivered step one of care we've done our personalized self-care plan local and systemic risk factor control super gingival pmpr we're going to recall the patient in three months time that was the end of the first course of treatment that was a band two claim okay it was a band two claim close down the course of treatment reassess them re-examine them re-examine them in three months time okay in the interim period there's a recommendation there to look at, you know, remote consultation. And one of the things that actually just made me laugh a little bit when I was just looking through that Priya study again, it was that telephone call. They uh, they put down the the reduction in the oral hygiene of or the improvement in the oral hygiene of the uh, of the test group down to that phone call rather than just sending them an email. So you know, it's something that you know your DCPs or uh, appropriate trained member of staff can do. But it's a recommendation just to you know follow that up to engage with the patient to try and encourage them to engage with that process so that when the patient does come back for three months re-examination reassessment, they are you know have achieved adequate uh, control in their oral hygiene, reduction in plaque and bleeding scores, and are able to engage with that process. Okay, so we're now going to re-examine, re-evaluate the patient three months later. Okay, this is your second course of treatment now. Okay, we're going to repeat our plaque and bleeding scores and we're going to assess patient engagement. Okay, and so how are we defining patient engagement? Well, here we've used either your plaque scores are less than 20% or your marginal bleeding scores are less than 30% or you've had a greater than 50% improvement in both. Okay, and the patient has a preference to achieving uh, you know, stability and health. Or there's insufficient improvement in oral hygiene. There's less than 50% improvement in both plaque and bleeding in both plaque and bleeding scores. So your marginal bleeding scores are over 30%, and your plaque scores are over 20%. Or the patient has stated they'd rather have a palliative approach to periodontal care. Um, in healthy gums, we matter. We do use slightly, you know, different thresholds. This is a, you know, slightly. We've been working that for the past seven, eight years, and, and, and you know, we had some evidence base behind that to support those. Uh, higher levels, we don't use disclosing there, but that's an alternative method that we've been piloting, testing, and now, you know, been using for a while in Greater Manchester, and now it's also available on the BSP website for you to access and have a look through that document if that uh, is something you want to use as well. Okay, so once we've done our re-examination, re-evaluation, if the patient is non-engaging, okay, so they had insufficient improvement in their oral hygiene, then we are going to re repeat step one of care okay repeat step one of care re-examination reassessment we will record the bpe here because we have we well, delaying our six point pocket chart repeat the plaque and bleeding scores check uh, the patient uh, compliance you know if we have the patient agreement like we do in healthy gums we matter we re-establish that patient agreement we document their brushing regime into dental cleaning regime or hygiene levels um, their progress with their risk factor control, and we try and re-motivate and reinforce the, you know, our oral hygiene and get the patient to engage. Because ultimately, if the patient engages, it will produce the successful outcome. So we're re-establishing the patient's self-care responsibilities, advising the patient that step two of care won't be successful unless they, it is supported by adequate oral hygiene. If we are trying to eliminate toxins and bugs from below the gum, we don't stand much of a chance if the patient can't do it above the gum successfully. So we document the reasons for delaying step two of care and delaying subgingival instrumentation, subgingival PMPR in our pocket chart, and we're going to repeat step one of care. So redo our supragingival PMPR, 
plus or minus subgingival scaling of the clinical crowns of teeth. Now, here we've allowed a second band two payment for this non-engaging patient. Why? Because we realize in the first course of treatment, there might be other things that you need to do, stabilization, stabilization of caries, extraction of teeth, etc. Whereas here, it will be a more perio-focused appointment. But we do expect this to be, you know, we would expect it really to be more than one visit and, you know, taking more time. So it's not just your, you know, quick uh, checkup there. It will be more than that, usually over two visits. And really is to try and get the patient to engage, try and change their behavior and encourage them to engage with that process. Because ultimately, if they do that, we will get successful outcomes. For that non-engaging patient, we will then re-examine, reassess them three months later. And if they still then remain non-engaging, then we're really into palliative periodontal care. Okay, so again, we go through our process. We record our, uh, uh, do our examination, record our BPE, record the plaque and bleeding scores, how the patients engage with their brushing regime, interdental cleaning regime. Um, again, advise the patient that, you know, step two of care won't be successful, but now we're more moving into a palliative periodontal care approach until the patient is able to achieve adequate oral hygiene. The patient needs to be aware that this is more of a palliative care approach. Okay, um, what is that entail then? So for stages one and two periodontitis, that's every six months. So that's a simple, uh, that will be a band one uh, course of treatment. And for stages three and four periodontitis, this is every three months. So this is our safety net. And this will, the patient will continue until they engage. And if they engage, they can then pro progress onto step two of care. What is palliative periodontal care? Then this is taken from the commissioning standard in restorative de dentistry. Also, this is in the Healthy Government Do Matter Toolkit. But it's a simple cost-effective maintenance protocol that involves regular removal of calculus and remotivation of patients. It's a brief intervent intervention, that can be carried out by DCPs and has been shown to improve length of tooth retention. But it's far less effective than your conventional non-surgical approach, root surface debridement, subgingival PMPR but it's a pragmatic one and it requires long-term re-evaluation, really assessing the patients and hopefully transitioning them from a non-engaging patient to an engaging patient at some point in the future. In principle, advanced restorative care is inappropriate in a non-engaging patient. It's also important that the patient is briefed on what is palliative periodontal care and, you know, sometimes these can be a driver to change. You know, if they really understand that, sometimes that could be that driver and that trigger to change the patient's behavior and encourage them to engage. So that was the non-engaging patient. At the three-month evaluation, if the patient was engaging, then they move on to step two of care. Okay, so we're now going to step two of care at that three-month reassessment, re-evaluation. If the patient was engaging, they will now move on to step two of care. This is your second course of treatment, your second band two course of treatment, engaging patients only. Again, it's now your formal periodontal therapy. What are we gonna do in this course of treatment? Then we are going to do our examination risk assessment. Okay, repeat our plaque and bleeding scores. We will document again the patient's oral hygiene, the interdental cleaning, how well they're cleaning, areas they're missing, any risk factor, uh, systemic risk factor control. And then we're going to do our detailed periodontal examination, our six point pocket chart, if you know, whatever you want to call it, in line with the BPE guideline, uh, BSD guidelines. Okay, once we've got our pocket chart, we've now identified our disease sites, and we're gonna do our supra and subgingival professional mechanical plaque control with the aim of removing plaque calculus and endotoxin from the root surface, so our non-surgical approach to therapy. Reinforce uh, your OHI, your, where patients need to maybe concentrate more. You might find that you know some of the easier areas to clean are resolving well, where the, some of the difficult areas the patient needs to have a bit more time uh, put, put in, so your lower linguals, for example, low posterior linguals, upper palatals, these sorts of areas, okay? And we've said that whole mouth treatment ideally should be completed within two to four weeks. And that's a band two course of treatment. So this is your second band two course of treatment. We're now gonna close the treatment down and we're gonna recall the patient three months later. Again, three months later on an engaging patient, they will come back and now we'll reassess the patient. We're now into potentially step three of care or step four of care, depending upon the outcomes of their uh, of their treatment and how well the patient responded. So step three of care, what does it involve? It's re-examination, reassessment, and it's redoing our detailed periodontal examination and identifying non-responding sites. Okay. 
So what does that entail? That will entail, again, your re-examination, reassessment, your plaque and bleeding scores, again, going through the same process, your oral hygiene regime, incidental cleaning, risk factors, and then your post-treatment detailed periodontal chart in line with your BSP guidelines. Okay, so your post-treatment chart, and then you will assess the post-treatment chart, and if there are still residual sites, then they will require some retreatment. And here it might be the case that some people will prefer to now refer that patient on if the patient still has a, a number of very deep sites there, um, then it could be a possible referral into level two care, especially when we're into stages three and four periodontitis. And we'll go through some of the, how you will interpret or make a decision upon that. But again, it is, it is really also dependent upon this, you know, the skill and the confidence of the clinician and how well they're doing. If this is now the patient, you can see a progression of reducing sites and we're going from, you know, 40 odd sites down to 20, now it's down to 10. And these are more in the tricky areas. You, you, you continue possibly with your re-subgingival re instrumentation, your re-subgingival PMPR, and you will uh, deliver that. And this is your third Bantu course of treatment. If that's not the case, then there is, you know, uh, guidance here to refer into level two or three care. Okay. And again, you know, uh, if the patient has got four sites or less with bleeding and probing, uh, if the patient has four sites or less with probing pocket depths of five millimeters or greater, then you can carry on treating those residual sites if we're down to this stage before making that decision to refer as well. Again, this is your third band two course of treatment. And then we'll re-examine, reassess the patient three months later. And this is really our outcome measure now and where we're making an assessment. The patient is either now going to need to go into supportive periodontal care or they will require a referral to level two or three care provision if the patient still has residual deep sites, whether that be probing pocket depths of four millimeters or greater with bleeding and probing. They've now had, you know, three courses of treatment. And if they still have residual deep pockets, it's now time for somebody else to take over their care. Step four of care is really in principle on patients with stable periodontitis or periodontitis in remission, as we've said, or have a number of residual sites that require long-term, you know, subgingival instrumentation. We'd hope that they were stable and not bleeding and probing, but if they were bleeding and probing, they will require, so, you know, continual subgingival instrumentation to hopefully get them to the absence of bleeding and probing there and if you're not sure then you know that referral pathway is always there for you so step four of care what does it entail again this is more than your simple checkup now so this is at the end of this pathway and again this step four of care is what you supportive care is something that the patients need lifelong so we've said once in a year this you know band two course of treatment can be delivered on your periodontitis patients uh, but, you know, it, it has to be more than just a simple checkup. It requires longer time. It requires your detailed periodontal chart to make sure the patient is either stable or in remission and there's no recurrence of disease. So as per the BSP guidelines, when the patient is in maintenance, then they require annual pocket charts at least. Uh, for, you know, uh, for myself, then I will be assessing my patients every time I re-examine and reassess the patient. So I'll be doing a pocket chart every time, whether that's in three months or six months, because I want to know is the disease now stable or is it unstable? Are there any unstable sites? If there are unstable sites, they will require some re instrumentation and then your reinforcement of your oral hygiene and your, so your lifelong support for that patient and your professional mechanical plaque control, okay? Again, longer appointment time is needed, needed but this is now your final band two course of treatment. The patient then goes onto your supportive care pathway, whether that's now in three months time six months time, nine months time, according to the patient's risk. And once in the year, then, you know, you, you, in order to, you know, uh, you know, fulfill those uh, uh, guidelines for your annual pocket charts, you will are able to claim that uh, band two course of treatment for once in the year on your patients in supportive periodontal care. Okay. For the referral pathways, then really it is a judgment call upon how you're feeling. If you are going through that pathway and you have an engaging patient and the patient's not responding, then it, the alarm bell, Sorry, could you say alarm bell should really be ringing and maybe it's a you know opportunity to refer. But in principle, this is taken from the restorative commissioning standard where it's mapping the stages of periodontitis or the classification to the levels of care. So we've mapped what the uh, classification now to the 
different uh, levels of care. For example, a stage two grade B, if you're you know, at step three of care, for example, and you have a stage two grade B patient who is still unstable, has deep pockets, then that care might now need a referral to a level two practitioner in the area. And that's something that the local uh, MCNs and area teams will be working on. And the last flow chart, this is what Ian put together. And I think, you know, as he said last time, you need to have a sit down and a read of this, but it basically is mapping the steps of care to the different stages of periodontitis and what steps of care you are delivering with the different stages of periodontitis. I hope that was uh, clear. Apologies, I had a couple of uh, issues during, the, during it with a bit of feedback, but that's the end there now, and I'm happy to take any questions. Hi, Shazad. Thank you so much for a brilliant talk. That was really insightful, and certainly I found it really helpful the way you went through the the practical detail of how we can, you know, care for our patients in accordance with these guidelines. I know certainly we've had quite a few questions come through already um, about just that. So if it's okay with you, I'll crack on with the questions in the order that they came through. Yeah, sure. Brilliant. I'll, so the try, first I'll, question... I'll, do, I'll do my best to answer them. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be able to do uh, uh, answer these brilliantly. So the first one that came through was, um, I understand that some patients will prefer a palliative approach to treatment if they do not want to engage with optimum OH measures and do not want to go through to step two treatment itself, or if they do not want to pay for additional visit, visits. How do I assess this preference and word the necessary questions? Thank you. So, I mean, for, for myself, then we, we in Healthy Gums do Matter, that's why we developed the patient leaflet and consent form. So I will go through that patient leaflet and consent form on, 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 on my new patient examination, for example. I will then give that to the patient to take away, to read, understand, digest. And when I reassess them, uh, you know, for the second visit in that course of treatment, I will then pick up on it and ask them how they've got on. Have they read it? Uh, did they have any concerns? Anything that they wanted to ask? and go through the risks and side effects of it and if the patient prefers not to have that treatment and they accept the fact that they will lose their teeth quicker um, then you know we have patients like that and some patients are just want to attend for emergency care so you know i will usually go through that periodontal leaflet and consent form and get it signed by the patient to say that you know they've read that they've understood that they understand they will lose their teeth quicker without any interventions they've opted not to have treatment um, and but if they want to you know change their mind at any time it's not a problem we, we're happy to engage with the patient anytime but I will usually get that document signed rather than just leaving it to um, writing it in within my notes but I'll go through that process is explaining the risks nature of the disease the uh, impact of it and also the side effects of it and for some patients they are happy to have treatment and the other patients you know they, they, they don't want to have the treatment you know, I've had patients, you know, I'm six years old, it's, you know, tooth has had a good innings there, if I lose it, I lose it. But you need to make sure you go through your process and you've gone through everything that you need to go through and you've outlined what are, what is the disease, what's the nature of the disease, what's the consequences of no treatment, and the fact that ultimately they will lose their teeth quicker rather than, uh, sooner rather than later if they opt not to have treatment. And if they don't want to have treatment, then, you know, I would go through that form and get it signed from them. And if they change their mind anytime, then we're happy to engage with them. Thanks so much, sir. That's great and a very thorough answer. Um, the next question is, um, what is the difference between subgingival scaling in step one and subgingival instrumentation that you mentioned in step two? Does PMPR in step one also mean we can go subgingively? Okay, so this is the... This is where the terminology is sometimes because of the regulation and the contract, um, you know, and, and, and what what is in the regulation with regards to a band two claims sometimes uh, where it says subgingival scaling and that's what elicits a band two claim. So when you're looking at step one of care, you're really looking at controlling supragingival plaque and calculus control. My policy, if I see calculus, I'll remove it. And in healthy gums matter, we do supra and subgingival scaling. That's different to root surface debridement. Root surface debridement is the meticulous cleaning of that root surface to decontaminate it for endotoxin. You can't see endotoxin, you can't detect endotoxin, you might be able to smell it, 
but that's all you can do. So the only way you can are going to be sure that you have decontaminated that root surface is that systematic, you know, debridement of that root surface, and that takes time. That's the key thing. So you might remove the calculus. That's the first bit. But then you need to go back in and systematically decontaminate that root surface. So the removal of calculus in step one, according to the avoidance of doubt document, is super gingival calculus. And sometimes you'll have calculus on the clinical crowns, which is subgingival due to gingival information, etc. So if you've got your gingival margin above your CEJ and you've got calculus there, then that technically is subgingival calculus. That's why we've termed it, you know, uh, termed it there. But in principle, in the avoidance of doubt, then you are removing super gingival calculus and any calculus, basically any calculus that's on the clinical crown. For myself, then, uh, as I've said, that you know, if I see calculus, I will remove it. So you saw you saw the case example that I that I showed you there. I you know that was super and sub gingival scaling, but it's not RSD. It's not non-surgical periodontal therapy because that would require double the time, triple the time, because I have to then go back in each site and then meticulously clean it and debride it and, and decontaminate it from that endotoxin. Hope Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, no, that was really clear. Thank you. Um, th there's two questions that come in from separate people that are kind of similar, so I'm going to group them together for you. So okay. the first was, how many appointments can you do in step one? And the second one was the first patient that you showed uh, with the, the, the case series, um, the photographs with the lady who bump, was bumped in the mouth by her child mm -hmm. and was then motivated to come to, to visit you after a sustained period away. Mm -hmm. How many visits and how long clinical time did you spend on step one of care in that case? How many OH visits and how long to remove the calculus? Could you also please explain how long between your first and third photograph? Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, the first question was again. I've how many appointments can many, you do? Step right, one? so there's no stipulation in the regulation upon how many appointments you need for a course of treatment. You need to do what's clinically necessary. With Healthy Gums Do Matter, we put a safety net in where we, we put in that if you're doing the step one of care, it's a minimum of two visits. That's our safety net in Healthy Gums Do Matter. But this is avoidance of doubt. And avoidance of doubt is obviously regulated by the guidelines. The guidelines don't stipulate that, you know, how many visits you need in order to be able to deliver a band two course of treatment. But there is an understanding and an expectation, you know, that it will take longer than a simple, you know, 20 minute appointment. You know, so we are, you know, the detail on what you will need to do, we are expecting it would take more than a 20 minute appointment. So, you know, it's going to take longer than that in order to deliver step one of care properly. Um, a lot of that's about educating and motivating the patient. And so, you know, that's why, although they haven't put in the avoidance of doubt document, this should take more than one visit. We, they've put, they worded it, we expect this to take more than one visit. So there's an expectation there. And again, there'll be a, a, a possible audit tool out soon with regards to these uh, guidelines. So you can audit yourself and, and see how well you're pre performing against uh, this uh, document there that's I think currently being developed I'm not sure if I was allowed to say that or not apologies Ian if, if I wasn't but there we go with regards to that patient there then that was an interesting case she had um, a number of issues and she failed a couple of times but the first appointment was a new patient examination usually that's you know 20 minutes outside of COVID inside of COVID it's 30 minutes and I gave I delivered all my uh, you know examination um, on that first visit and I like to do my patient agreement and education on the second visit, I can get the patient back in to uh, re-examine, reassess them and do my radiographs and definitive diagnosis and then do my treatment plan and finalize my treatment plan. So that patient had, after that first 20 minute appointment, the second picture you saw was how she came back about two, three weeks later. She failed an appointment, then we, we got, a, then she attended the next one, um, but she couldn't have treatment done at that appointment because she had childcare issues. So we did radiographs and we just did my definitive diagnosis. And then we booked her back in uh, for a third appointment. And that, uh, that, that's a specific case which I don't like to do. And in that case, I had to do it in one visit because she had childcare issues. But I had to numb, basically numb the whole mouth uh, in order to be able to do that. And she was prepared for that and because she was having childcare issues. But usually that case, I'd like to do over two visits. So that'd be three visits in total. The first exa uh, examination visit, and then you follow up visits, you know, it could be between 30 and 40 minutes. Um, you know, numb up half the uh, half, uh, half the mouth and then debride half the mouth and the other half of the mouth. And I, alongside that, if I've got any restorations to do, then the time will vary accordingly. So if I've 
that patient had restorations as well, then it will be new patient examination. Second appointment will be a longer appointment for radiographs, uh, uh, definitive diagnosis, uh, my patient agreement, and then doing any uh, restorations and super subgingival scaling on the left hand side. If you know there's not too many restorations to do, and then the third visit will be super subgingival scaling and restorations on the right hand side. The issue here is that step one is the hardest. It is the hardest and it is the most underfunded and it's the most difficult. But as you work your way through the pathway, it gets easier. Because if the patient is engaging and you, your hard work is putting at the beginning, and yes, you know, it, it, sometimes it's not that cost effective at the beginning of the pathway, but it balances itself out towards the end of the pathway. If that patient engages and they come back three months later, they will have less disease sites, less pocketing, less pocketing, you know, if you're following the current BSP guidelines, you know, in the BP guidelines, you need, you know, you can do a pocket chart and you only need to record pockets of four millimeters or greater with or without bleeding. So you have less pockets to chart and less pockets to treat. And so your treatment, you know, time can then reduce, especially having massive reduction in size. So step two of care can be less, step three of care less. And so as you work through the pathway, and that's how this pathway has sort of been, you know, trying to fit within the UDA model. I hope that made sense. That does make sense. There is a question that's very similar mm -hmm. to what you just just mentioned, but I've also just had a, com uh, a comment come through um, saying, surely that can't be financially viable. Does this work financially on the NHS? So while I'm just finding the next question, perhaps you can answer whether you feel that's financially viable in the current uh, UDA NHS contract system. So this is this is a phase care pathway approach. So it's not just you, you can't just look at it as one course of treatment. This is a journey for the patient. So over the three or four courses of the treatment, then you know it sort of balances itself out. Thank you, uh, Shazad. Um, completely agree there. Um, and ultimately, so this is this is the contract we work in. You you you. And and you know we have to work within the contract. And in some cases we win, and some cases we lose. Some cases, you know, that come as new patient, ex you know, examinations and got 10, 15 restorations to do, you know, it, those are the ones that we, you know, we have to deliver. And then, you know, hopefully we hope as they move through the pathway that, it, that that sort of balances itself out and it becomes a bit more cost effective. Um, and uh, I think there's a response to that. But when they FTA or don't engage, then you've gone through the more arduous stage one step without getting the reward later down the line, have you not? Yes, but that's, you know, that that is part of, you know, the system we work in and, uh, you know, what's there? If the patient does FDA and you've done your best to try and re-engage that patient and get them back in, then um, yes, you know, uh, you have delivered it. Well, but I'd hope that, the, you know, the patient has learned something from my conversations with them to take away to benefit them going forward as a life experience yes it might not you know necessarily benefit us financially but you know we have you know signed up to be dentists and we have a professional legal ethical moral duty of care and we have to you know go through that thank you Shazad. agree um i think you touched on this with your your um last uh, with the last kind of series of questions there about um the appointment times and what you do in step one but somebody's asked um, how long do you leave it um, after you've delivered the OHI and, and toothbrush instruction, et cetera, before you get the patient back to reassess their engagement? So I'm not reassessing the engagement within the first course of treatment. My first course of treatment is delivering step one of care and recording the baseline of how they presented to me. So my baseline plaque and bleeding scores. I am then delivering step one of care, their personalized self-care plan, super gingival plaque uh, and calculus removal. And then I'm re-examining, reassessing them three months later. At that three-month re-examination reassessment is when I'm assessing: is this patient engaging or non-engaging? Does that make sense, or? Yeah. Um, well, it made sense to me. So thank you very much. Yeah. So, so it's, not, um, it's not. It's not the fact that they are. Or, and this is what the previous study talked about as well. The previous study talks about this amalgamation of the OH, the oral hygiene phase of treatment into the actual treatment phase as well. I think the S3 guidelines has helped us to sort of differentiate between that, but step one of care is including your oral hygiene and your super gingival plaque control and elimination of risk factors, which is your you know, plaque and calculus. So that's all in step one of care, one course of treatment. Three months later, re-examination, reassessment, is the patient engaging or non-engaging? 
Thank you. Um, so we have quite a few more questions, so I'll um, try to get through these in the order that they've come through. But the next one says, thank you for an excellent talk. Could you please clarify that every band two requires an oral health assessment by the GDP? So for four courses of perio treatment, we would need four times oral health assessments. And by this, I mean progressing through the steps one to four with four courses of treatment. Thank you. Uh, I don't, what, what do they mean by oral health assessment? I mean, as a, as a baseline, every time I re-examine, reassess my patients, I need to have data that I can compare to as, a, as the patient is progressing through that journey. So I need to document their brushing regime, interdental cleaning regime, what sizes they're using, what colors they're using, uh, you know, uh, where they're using them, how often are they using them? Are they using the single tufted brush, for example, that's what I, you know, recommend, uh, mouthwashes, etc. That data I can then compare. If they're only interdental cleaning once a week, when I see them three months later and they're doing it three times a week, well, I can see the progress. So the plaque and bleeding scores are one element to assess patient engagement, but it's also what goes behind that as well. Um, the, if they mean the patient agreement and leaflet and consent form, then I don't do that every single time I, you know, re-examine the patient. No, I uh, that patient agreement is again that was part of healthy gums matter, but it's just a, something if you want to use it. You can use it here, but I, I usually do that in the first course of treatment. And, you know, in principle, I will build that up until the patient is at the protocol that I want them to be able to, you know, do on a, uh, on a daily basis. So sometimes I will see patients who don't brush every, every every week. So if the patient's not brushing every week, I can't expect them to just jump into, you know, 20 minutes brushing twice a day with, you know, so, you know your toothbrush, your single tufted brush, interdental brushes all at once. Some patients might engage that far, but it's then a, your personal uh, you, you know sort of gauge with that patient is it, are they going to uh, be able to achieve that are they motivated to achieve that um and I, we had a ifd who had a had a, had a really nice case um recently who who hadn't been for 10 15 years and, and you know a similar you know case you know they went through the full protocol and the, you know came back a couple of weeks later massive improvement but some patients won't so i might in that patient agreement say i just want you to brush once a day for two three minutes and then i'll build it up and as as i'm building it up i'll then get to the final protocol whatever that is for that patient individualized personalized to me in order to be able to achieve the plaque control that it is needed to move on to step two of care and then you know in principle I, you know if i need to come back to a patient agreement i will do um, but otherwise not necessarily each course of treatment no but i am documenting the history of the patient and my clinical findings because how else am i going to compare how that patient has progressed through that journey and also from a medical legal perspective just putting down a plaque and bleeding score is one element of it but everything that goes behind that plaque and bleeding score so the patient engagement the brushing regime the interdental cleaning regime you know the smoke again these are all the things that are there that you need to document that also do it again in our medical history form we have a self-reported patient questionnaire where we have a brief uh, questionnaire upon the brushing regime interdental cleaning how long they're brushing for how often, etc., and that's filled in by the patient. So that patient does it every two years, you know, at le you know, at least a minimum every two years when they update their medical history and complete a new form. Again, that's another data set to say if that patient is non-engaging, then that's a, another, you know, sort of piece of information there to support you. I, I, I don't know if I answered that or not. Well, well, I think you did, but the person who posed the original question has um, come back in the comments and said that they've asked that question because Shazad mentioned an oral health assessment and then said, inverted commas, don't shoot the messenger. Oh, that's a that's a therapist. That's a via dentist. So if they're talking about a dentist, a hygienist and therapist, then a dentist needs to do an, or an examination. That's the regulation for being able to claim on the NHS. In order to be able to claim a band two course of treatment, an examination must be undertaken by a dentist. That's what it, you know, that re, you know, regulation says. That's why I said don't shoot the messenger. We want skill mix. We want hygienists and therapists to be able to engage. But you know, we are where we are with the current regulation. It would be nice to be able to see, you know, uh, and I'm not sure whether the pilots are able to. Where you know, if if you have hygienists and then we have, you know, we have hygienists and therapists in one uh, in one of our sites. Who work fully within the nhs but again the examination needs to be undertaken by a dentist in order to be able to fulfill the criteria and regulation for your nhs claim and we i've had another question come through on exactly that point so i will ask this one as well because it's relevant to what you've just said yeah um it's a bit of a tricky one because obviously you haven't set the rules you're just working within the, the, oh, the, the, the message, I, 
I, I've spent the past nine years trying to make this work. Exactly. And, it, and, and uh, in all honesty, this is a really good progress for this document. This document, Same. because before we've been doing this approach and teaching this approach for the past seven, eight years, and now it's sort of official recognition that yes, you can have multiple courses of Bantu treatment for perio patients. We need to recognize that there needs to be a lot more significant investment into managing periodontitis uh, within within practice if we're going to get successful outcomes. So the question that's come through is why, but why can't a hygienist or therapist do the perio without a dentist doing the oral care assessment? Because I feel I'm perfectly capable of doing this. I am um, sure. I want to make it work too, and that's why I'm asking. But we need to utilize the full team skill set. We do, and that's you know above my pay grade. <laughs> and I, I must admit, it's that's a very tricky question for you to answer because you don't set the rules; you just have to work, with, you know, them. work within them and adapt them to your Correct. practice. And uh, sometimes also the people behind the scenes as well. You know, one of the things that I, I have had access to sometimes the difficulties of getting documents through. This document has to go through a gateway. It was sat in a gateway for a period of time before it actually got released, like the commissioning restorative standard. I mean, I can tell you a funny story about the commissioning restorative standard. You know, uh, I went back and forth with Ian because this palliative periodontal care approach was in the commissioning restorative standard draft before it got went through the gateway and got a re released officially. I was updating Healthy Gums Do Matter to write the second edition, and I wanted to put that statement in. And I went to Ian. I said, Ian, I've got nowhere to reference this to because the commissioning standard hasn't been released yet. But you know, he said he agreed that you know we should put it in. And then the, you know, then the commissioning standard got released. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you know, we we started this journey back in 2008, seven and eight, looking at skill mix with Colette uh, Bridgman back in um, Oldham and Salford, where we were looking at EDDNs and you know uh, fluoride varnishes. We were one of the first uh, people in the country to have uh, nurses who could apply fluoride varnishes. But again, you know, it was it was regulation is 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 difficult because you know the regulation states you know that you need to have um an examination carried out by a dentist so i it would it, it, you know let's hope that you know that changes soon i'd like to see it change soon and i have you know i have no doubt that our hygienists and therapists are fully capable of doing a you know examination assessment and a, a, you know of, of the periodontal condition so we have ian chapel on the line and well, I, I, must have been, I must have been naughty oh dearie me he has um kindly popped into the uh, comments box um, okay. regarding the need for each course of treatment being opened by a dentist the pragmatic view is that practices find pragmatic solutions whereby potentially hygiene and therapy can uh, check in his view and then liaise with the dentist who could open a course of treatment via sensible channels of communication you know, I, yeah and he can he can say he can say that, you know I, I don't want to get into trouble but yeah you make it work within your practice I mean you know take a pragmatic approach you know uh, we are where we are um thank you um you i'm just going to ask uh, the the last before uh, about six more questions and time is pressing on so i'm just going to ask the last few as well so with regards to healthy gums do matter the modified plaque scores are done without disclosing and scored zero one two no plaque plaque on probing and visible plaque yep. you have said today to disclose the score uh disclose and score either zero or one has the original healthy gums do matter guidance changed no it hasn't that is is uh its own approach very much similar to this approach but we have used a non-disclosing method there and that, you know, but this is an official NHS avoidance of doubt document, which has been agreed upon by different varying parties. And this is what has been agreed. And this is what we put forward. But, you know, we've made it pragmatic in the fact that you only need to use Ramford's teeth. Can you use healthy gums do matter approach? Yes, you can. And we've also referenced that within the avoidance of doubt documents that that is a valid system and framework to use if you want to use that. The key thing is, you, you know, plaque scores, for me, you know, plaque scores are important, but bleeding scores are more important. Thanks so much, Zed. Um, the next question is an interesting one. Can we progress patients from stage one to stage two if the patient on uh, the patient that is engaging in oral hygiene um, and is in, engaging in improving their, their oral hygiene approaches, but if they refuse to stop smoking? 
So again, that is above my pay grade to have smoking as a uh, as a factor for non-engagement. And we had this discussion again when we did Healthy Gums We Matter. Um, and again here, you know, we have used plaque and bleeding scores uh, to assess patient engagement. Um, but if the patient continues to smoke, we haven't said that, you know, that is a barrier to not have treatment. Um, because then you open the doors, uh, you know, uh, can obese patients have certain procedures done? Can this, you, you, do you understand what I mean? And so that that is a, uh, you know, until somebody higher above says, no, we're gonna, you know, that's the, you know, what we're gonna put in place. But you need to educate your patients. Ultimately, the treatment won't be successful. And it might be, you know, that they need to refer, you know, referring to some specialist smoking cessation services, uh, if they're keen and eager to try and stop, because ultimately, you know, they, you know, if, if they're going to have a poorer prognosis if they continue to smoke. But, you know, maybe you can at least get them to reduce the dose because it's still dependent. So if they go down from, you know, 20 to 10, that's an improvement. You know, approximately half of your periodontal risk in, in relation to smoking if, they reduce, if they're reducing their smoking by half. And so there are some practical methods, but is it a barrier to saying that you can't move on to step two of care? Then uh, we haven't done that in healthy ones matter and neither is it the case here in avoidance of doubt. Thank you so much, Azad. Um, the next question is re regarding level two and three NHS options. Um, mm. Are these available all over the country? Because in our area, there are no dental hospitals to refer to, and therefore referral is only available to private specialists or uh, dentists with special interests. But that's always seems to be on a private basis. So again, um, it's a, it is, you know, depending upon different areas, you know, the, the, you know, it, it varies. I mean, you know, if you go down south, it could be up to an hour or an hour and a half drive to a, uh, a dental hospital or, or a centre that's providing level two and three care services. Um, and you know, it's, it's 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 down to every individual MCN and local area team to be able to develop resources and meet the needs of their local community. And that's part of the, you know, I, I am part of the MCN in Greater Manchester and we're looking at that and we're trying to, you know, wait, look at ways of developing more level two and three, three care practitioners. But ultimately, you you know, if your nearest, you know, level two and three care referral centre is, you know, an hour away, then the patient needs to be given the option that that is where it is. And, you know, you write it down, the patient is offered that referral. And if they accept it, fine. If they don't accept it and want to carry on, then it might be a case that you need to manage it within practice and either that or it's you know something to take up with your local MCN and area team you know in that area um, you know we were trying to get things right and it's taken a long time to get to here and you know building on from this and meaning and go back and forth about the level two and care three care you know services um, you know and 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 the colors we, we I think we, we read colors in the opposite way but that's a joke between me and him but um, you know, he, he he has a valid argument. He said that, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, as we are protecting the minimum standard and there are going to be the minimum standard out there and there's going to be practitioners with, you know, different levels going upwards all the way up to, level, you know, enhanced skills to specialists. And some people, you know, people might be comfortable managing more of, you know, those cases later on, you know, further down that pathway than others, whereas others might want to refer er earlier. And so we need to try and develop services within areas to be able to meet that need and demand uh, for patients. It's been a bit of a um, put on the side because of COVID, um, but, you know, it is something that I, we are trying to do in Great, Greater Manchester, you know, but it's not always easy when there's no funding. Very good point. Thank you, um, Shazad. Um, somebody's asked, um, they've said, at present, I'm taking plaque and bleeding scores at each visit that I see the patient. Uh, during step one therapy, are you suggesting that for each of the visits I see the patient for the PMPR, um, I don't need to take indices and that I can just wait three months before retaking them? In this pathway, yes. And that's what we do in Healthy Gums. That's our pragmatic approach. If you are, you know, where we are saying you do your step one of care in one course of treatment, you do your plaque and bleeding scores. That's how the patient presented to you. You've now intervened, educated the patient, removed super gingival calculus so they can now you know take ownership and control of their super gingival plaque control and you reassess them three months later and do your plaque and bleeding scores if they're engaging then they move on to step two of care so you don't have to do it single, single time that you're seeing it 
in that visit. I mean, if you want to, you can do, but I, I don't. <laughs> Uh, no, that's really helpful. Thank you, Shazad. Someone said, thank you so much. The webinar was incredibly helpful. Um, my doubt is, though, do we need to take written consent from every periodontitis patient or would verbal consent be sufficient? Please do let me know how we need to plan regarding the patient's consent. What will I say about consent? Well, in, we haven't said that you've needed written consent in avoidance of doubt. That written consent forms as part of Healthy Gums Do Matter. It's just a resource that I put there for anybody who wants to utilize it. In Healthy Gums Do Matter, in our pathways, you have to do it. And we've made it a part of the pathway. Um, consent is more than just getting a patient to sign a document. You have to have, you know, have shown that the patient has had enough time to read, digest, understand, come back with questions, and then sign that form. That's why I give it on visit one and I get it signed on another visit when they come back. Um, so you know it, it, it just depends on how confident you are with you know your record keeping everything else if you're going to do a, you know i mean i get consent forms signed for extractions for crowns for root canal treatments immediate dentures it's just the way i've you know I, I, i've gone now and and we we developed our consent forms and 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 for me personally i like to get consent forms signed i like to you know that that demonstrates that the patient has had time to read and digest and understand and then sign to give informed consent. Now, some practitioners out there don't necessarily get consent form signed and they do it written. So, you know, it's, it's an individual choice, but, you know, uh, in the avoidance of doubt, we haven't said written consent. Obviously, informed consent is a process. Uh, and if you write it down, fair enough. But then, you know, if, you know, for me, I'm of X Files generation, I trust no one. That's the problem. And so I want to make sure that's why the. <laughs> Periodontal leaflet and consent form is on two pages because I never wanted the patient to go away and said I only got page one and then get page two. So that's why we've done it as a double sided carbonated copy in our practice. Yeah, very thorough. Um, how do we get dentists to refer patients that are hygienist on NHS and follow these stepwise approaches to treatment when they have to pay for the hygienist time and say it leaves them with little to zero pay due to the UDA system? Sorry, uh, can you repeat it again? Sorry. So yes, certainly. So the question is, yeah. how do we get dentists to refer patients to the hygienist on the NHS and follow this stepped approach when they have to pay for the hygienist time? And if it especially if it leaves them with little to zero pay due to the UDA system? Well, it depends how you want to make that, you know, skill mix work in your practice. At the end of the day, your therapist and hygienist working within the NHS and you referring them patients, it will be generating UDAs. You'll do the examination and you might then send, you know, your, you know, uh, for example, your, you know, super subgenual PMPR. You might ask them to do a, a detailed pocket chart uh, and do the super subgenual PMPR. And that frees up your time to be able to then you know see other patients and so they will all you know you you've done the examination fulfilled the regulation criteria they can then complete that course of treatment and it's a bantu claim so you know they are generating udas it's just how you make that work in what proportions and what ratios it's obviously down to individual practices and how they want to make it work we have a, a fully nhs uh, um, uh, therapist at one of our sites i am now going to get one very soon because i'm getting old now and, and i'm getting tired as well my back's giving up so i, I said i said I, we, you know hopefully we've got space now that i can we can have a therapist in our practice and, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting one in very soon uh, sounds like a, a good thing for your back if nothing else there she's had mm -hmm. um the the final question is about private practice and yeah. um they've asked how do we implement these steps when a patient is seen privately so you can have a look at the Healthy Gums Do Matter Toolkit. Anything you know that is valid from the NHS, and you know uh, GDC is not interested whether you're NHS or private. They're interested whether you fulfil what's in the best interest for that patient. So something that stands up, stands up medical legally within the NHS is also standing up medical legally privately. Healthy Gums Do Matter, you know, is there. Um, the, you know, this is a sort of you know a, a, probably a bit more simplified uh, version of that uh, to approach. But you know, you can follow that stepwise approach through 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 care we have you know you, if you if you want to you know use this uh, avoidance of doubt you can you know it, it, it is there but you record keeping and everything needs to go beside it healthy gums do matter was really a package that we we didn't want to just put out a few pathways we wanted to make a comprehensive resource 
available for practitioners to help them as much as we can by doing patient agreements, patient leaflet and consent forms, having them there so they can download them, print them, put your logos on them, do what you want with them, having the toolkit available, the BSP you know, is now hosting that on, on, on the website as well, that you can access and utilize as you know that as much as you like. And so if you follow that pathway and you go through and you, you do what's there, then you you know whether you're private or uh, NHS, then, then then it's still valid. How you want to charge, then you know that's up to yourself. I mean, I don't think I can advise on that. Thank you so much, Zad. That's um, really helpful. And that actually is all of the questions that we've had come through um, tonight. So I would just like to say uh, thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and stayed with us for uh, much longer than the webinar was meant to go on for. But obviously, the the talk was uh, one that you know lots of questions and um, Shazad very kindly has stayed on to to answer all of those and make sure that everybody um, had their questions answered. So thank you all for for tuning in and listening. Shazad, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, for, and without, I think Leicester on Liverpool today was it? And then is I think I think uh, what uh, oh the apprentice is about to start now, so just in time for the apprentice then. Yeah, exactly. I'm not really a big TV watcher, but I'll uh, I'll take your word for it. But um, thank you so much uh, for your time, and uh, I'll draw tonight's um, webinar to a close. Thank you so much.